Welcome back, everyone, to another exciting episode of the Toro Cigar Lounge Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Glover, a.k.a. 757 Cigar Mike. Stay tuned today, ladies and gentlemen. You are not going to want to miss this episode. Today, we got E.J. Snyder, author, TV personality, and overall badass veteran. Welcome. We'll be right back. In a world desperate to separate us by our differences, there's still a place where you can go where all are welcome. The Cigar Lounge. Welcome to the Toro Cigar Lounge Podcast. Founded by Loyalty Cigars, where loyalty truly is thicker than blood. Our collection features bold, handcrafted cigars named after the legendary wolves of the Norse gods Freki, Gary, Fenrir, and Hattie. Each one is a tribute to the strength and courage of the wolves who inspired us. Whether you're unwinding with a Freki or attacking the night with Fenrir, you're not just smoking a cigar, you're embracing a legacy. Elevate your experience with Family by Loyalty Cigars. Get yours over at Toro Cigar Company and discover why we're changing the cigar game. And so, yeah, so I've had a wonderful second career. Uh, I uh, was teaching uh, survival at my website, ejsnyder.com. If you want to link up with me, my social media is just go to ejsnyder.com. Um, I was selling a lot of gear on there, but I backed that off because I got into some other businesses. So I kind of put my own business on, on hold. Uh, but now I'm going to ramp that back up in 2025. Uh, I've got lots of videos over there uh, for purchase that teaches you about different things of survival and bugging in, which is what the book uh derived from uh we're gonna start putting some more stuff up there i got a lot of affiliates over there uh with good gear that i recommend um some were sponsors at one time in my life some aren't but i still like their gear so i still recommend it um and now i'm into several other businesses is what's come into my life uh at this point and i'm just trying to build a legacy and a financial security blanket for the last of my years here but I think I'll always be doing something, you know, like I said, I want to do like one more TV show for one last hoorah. Uh, but I'm enjoying very much creating these businesses and helping veterans. That's where my life's gone. I've just spent probably six weeks in Western North Carolina with hurricane relief stuff. I just went out there to help our guy doc and my buddy, uh, uh, Dan Hendricks and his wife. And I wound up staying like three weeks that time. And then I came back, got a refit, went back out there and, I'm going to be going back out there again very soon. Um, but it's talk, what talk a little yeah. bit about the devastation that happened out there because even yeah. even the media is not really covering it, I think, the way it should be mm-hmm. being covered. What did you see when you were out there? I will liken it after that was the 34th named storm I've been a part of. I went out there just as it was hitting. Uh, I was driving my way out to Prepper Camp, and it was supposed to hit Atlanta and take a left turn to Nashville. That's another thing we'll get to in a minute. And instead, it went straight to Saluda, where I was headed. So when I got there, there was trees in the highway, messed up, everything. I just had my chainsaw. I just started cutting the way because we had a bunch of people that showed up early, 250, as a matter of fact, because for them, uh, prepper camp that happens the end of September in Saluda, North Carolina, every year for the last decade, is like Disney World for those people. So they go there and plan vacations around it. They were camping out. The only thing that really helped them was they were down in a bowl with high ground around them. So when the storm came over the top of them, they got a lot of wind and stuff, but they were pretty much spared because of that reason. Uh, And then I just stayed out there for five days. We did the event for a day and a half for who was there. And uh, what better place than to be in a storm with but survivalists? And so I saw Hendersonville was a, was actually an island. Uh, I couldn't get to it um, because it was pretty much an island. Um, and I was like, man, this is really bad. And, and the only thing that forced me back to Fayetteville was an appointment. So as soon as I got back to Fayetteville, I started talking with my counterparts and we started pushing supplies forward. And then eventually I got the call about Doc. And, uh, and then Dan was in the same problem. And I... Loaded up my truck, bought a brand new trailer, a six by 10. I traded my five by eight in on it because it it was pretty beat up. And I wanted to have something I could rely on. And I loaded up with supplies and off I went. We took care of Doc uh, with my buddy, my Ranger buddy. And I went to Dan. And then I was there and the former COO of Blackwater, this guy, uh, Bill, uh, he was there and met with us. 
And we started talking about the organizational situation there and the problems. And so we went to this northern airfield up near Boone. And I had to go to Boone to check on a knife buddy of mine, Dan Winkler, who's a legend in the knife world. His shop had got really decimated. I wanted to check on him and his family. And we stopped at the uh, uh, Elk River um, Air Base. They were flying private planes in 50 a day with supplies. And they were going out with helicopters doing airdrops. And the Sentinel group there was running operations. We had a liaison from uh, the Samaritan, Samaritan's Purse and someone from the Red Cross. And there was uh, down there is Adam Smith in Asheville at the Asheville Harley Davidson where he worked. He had set up uh, basically an airfield there with helicopters. They could fit like six, at least six helicopters on this open area. They had supplies all out on the parking lot. They pretty much shut the Harley Davidson down because the Swanoa River area was decimated. And so I decided to start going from fob to fob. Ford operating base, for those that don't understand, that's what we're calling them out there. And I had a small crew of two vehicles, a Ranger medic with me. I had a, a Marine Intel guy who was amazing and very connected in the area with politicians and stuff. And then another, a female, uh, Mari, she was a transpo supply expert. And so I had just enough people that I needed. We were small, we were agile. We were bringing supplies up in the holler to where nobody else could reach. And I needed to understand every inch of the battle space from as far north as Boone, far south as Franklin, over to Chimney Rock and the entire Tennessee, North Carolina border. And so we were all over this place over a two week period, assessing the situation, getting real intel up. We had two intel people that combined their smarts together. And, and on Google, uh, Google Maps, they developed a measles chart where there was people needing help, where all the resource centers were. And it was better than anything the military was doing. And then the military threatened to kick us out. And so that was not going to be, a, a, you know, the, or not the military, the uh, the government said, hey, you guys are going to have to get the heck out of here. Uh, we're going to shut you down. We're going to confiscate all your supplies. And, and FEMA started doing some of that stuff. Um, and they were just really in the way. Uh, let the former special operators and first responders that were there, all the volunteers just do the effort. <clears throat> and so we went to and met with the Cherokee Nation, got permission to build one last fob down in the south and put up an airfield where they they you can't the government can't come into Cherokee territory. And they do call it territory, not a reservation. It is Cherokee territory. And they're buying up land <laughs> all around the, the Appalachia because pretty much they owned all of Appalachia. So they are steadily building, buying up land for. Uh, based off of, you know, casino profits and everything else they've got going on to basically take back their lands, which is really cool. But they gave us permission. And so we set another one up down there just in case everybody had to fall back to a safe zone. And I will tell you, of the 34 named storms I've been in, this is the most devastating damage I've ever seen. And I can only liken it to a war zone that I've walked in. That's how bad it was. I mean, for I looked in the Swanoa River. And there was debris everywhere. And there was a conex down there. The only reason I knew it was a metal conex, it was red. It, it, it had uh, numbers on it that you see on shipping containers. And it was twisted up like a big-ass piece of liquor stick. I mean, that's how powerful this river did these things. Whole villages are missing. They're reporting, I think, 107 dead with maybe six still missing. Those numbers, in my opinion, are so wrong and so off it's 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 not funny. I do I know how they're going to get to the real numbers? I don't know that. All I know is my friend was in a village of a thousand. And he said they were missing two hundred people that they hadn't accounted for. This was in the beginning. Maybe they have since. But for instance, there is a famous Koa uh, campground that is has a, like I think it was one hundred eighty uh, RV slots that were completely full. Mind you, we're going into the leaf the leaf uh, season where the leaves are changing, so a lot of people show up there. They buy their spots for like a month. It was completely full the night the storm hit. When you go by that koa, there was one RV left wrapped around the tree. The rest are all gone. They mm. were washed down the river with people in, their, in these RVs. The cadaver dogs are walking in the rivers, and they are getting positive hits all over the place. You have tons of mud, dirt, and rocks that came off the mountain. 
when we had eight, seven to eight inches of rain prior to the storm hitting. So it was already pretty soaked within a 24 hour period. <clears throat> and then there was the pre rain that came before the storm hit, which was another five inches. When the storm hit, it dumped 30 inches of rain in the mountains. Those little streams and those creeks that run up in the mountains, they became fissures. And what I mean by fissures is that they got so much water in that they broke away and became massive landslides down the mountains. Mm. When they slid off the side of the mountain, it broke open aquifers and underwater streams, you know, underwater rivers that are underneath the ground. That water dumped out. You had in a 50-foot wall of water and rocks coming down the mountain at you. In my friend's area, Dan, it lives in Elk Park. He's the one I went to go help. He's like, EJ, this, is a, uh, this was a trout stream here. It was maybe 30, 40 feet across, maybe 10, 15 feet deep. And look at all these rocks here. And as you look at the houses to the left and right, tens of thousands of rocks. What used to be grass lawns, they now have rock gardens in their front yard. Mm -hmm. He says, you see this big rock here, this boulder? We used to have a waterfall up here with two pillars. Those are gone. But this rock showed up. It was literally 20 feet across, 20 feet, uh, 25 feet high. A big, wow. massive boulder. I have no idea. He said he had no idea where this came from. And on top of the boulder, it had like a little bit of a flat. There was a cooler up there sitting. No man was going to climb up there to put the cooler up there. So the water was 50 or 60 feet in depth. At wow. Because everybody's up on the side. And there was <clears throat> houses and trailers all along this poor community all along the river. Gone. All gone. That's um, that, crazy. You hear rumors that, you know, Asheville, they're pulling bodies out of trees. We heard there were 400 bodies in the Asheville morgue uh, at the Asheville hospital. Um, you hear that they pulled 170 bodies out of the Toe River. Well, where'd they all go? Uh, we were getting rumors that FEMA was taking the bodies off to wherever. Uh, and this is stories from locals. And these people are living in these mountains forever, didn't never need the government's help. Um, they're building FEMA camps in the area to house seven to 800 people. But what are they planning on doing with all yeah. these people in this area? The other factors, um, you know, you hear these rooms there, they had the, the sheriff of Buscombe County, you're a piece of garbage. You're a fucking douchebag. You're not a leader. You're an asshole. Uh, you, you drink blue Kool-Aid. We all know that, uh, you grew up in the police force of Asheville and shame on you. Because you're a leadership failure. Understanding this was a catastrophic event, overwhelming for anybody, but that's what real leadership stands up. Roy Cooper, you are a disgrace. You are on your ass, uh, and it's a crying shame that your little, uh, 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 not to get political, but your little protege, Josh Stain, as I'll call him, is in charge now. So our poor state has to uh, be under your dumb leadership for another four years. Uh, but they were on their ass. The National Guard should have been stood up before the storm hit, and in place. What happened was 45 armed illegal gang members came into Asheville and stormed the hospital at gunpoint and took all the narcotics and the medicine out of there. If you're the sheriff of that county and you have a hospital that's probably going to, you're going to need that medication uh, for those that are injured, how can you have not secured that hospital and locked it down? Doesn't make any sense to me. And those same individuals went around looting uh, all through Asheville. Yes, Asheville was decimated, but it, it's just like, you know, yes, you're rescuing and trying to save lives, but at some point, the National Guard could have been there and secured that site. That's just that's just how you take care of business. Wow. And they didn't do that. And so shame on them. Shame on the federal government. They are absent. They have been absent. Then when Milton happens, they want to try and act like, oh, we get to redo. You don't get a redo. You don't get to push that storm into our area. And I know you fucking did it because we saw on radar the little blue blips that pushed a damn storm and kept it to the east side of the Appalachians, right into the Yakin, uh, the Yakin, the Maggie, and, the, and into the Swanoa Valley regions. Because guess what's there? Underneath the, the city of Asheville, underneath the city is the largest lithium mine on earth. Also in our area, in our mountains, is the largest clear crystal quartz mines in the United States. Hmm. Well, guess who has the rights to the minerals of the lithium mine underneath Asheville? 
good old Dougie. You know Dougie. Kamala, Kamala, I call her Clown Mala. Kamala <laughs> Harris's husband owns the mineral rights. So don't tell me. And then we have video of uh, these plumes, roughly about 12 inches in diameter, maybe a little bigger, shooting up out of the river into the sky 40 to 60 feet. Just pluming out. That's the heart machines they use, which help push you know into the atmosphere. Uh, we have it off of, uh, I think we were tracking them on Telegram. There's this one plane that belongs to NOAA, and it is a, a, a weather machine plane that seeds clouds, and it takes a certain pattern, and they were tracking that as well. And I'm not a tinfoil hat guy, but facts are facts. And then we have people taking video of the storm coming in, and you hear this noise, oh, oh, super loud throughout the storm. You know, uh, where's that coming from, right? <laughs> and so these different things caused this storm, which was most weathermen are pretty, love their jobs. They're, they pride themselves in what they do. We've gotten pretty accurate over the years. And their hurricane spaghetti models, not one of them had that Hurricane Helene doing anything but heading straight for Atlanta and taking about an 11 o'clock turn straight towards Nashville. Not one had it going straight before it turned once it got past Asheville. Not one. Hmm. So I understand Mother Nature, and she can do what she wants, um, but there's too much e clear evidence that shows things that we know they have and things they've been doing uh, actually happen. And uh, and the video's on YouTube. You can find all this stuff. Uh, don't oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, I, there was I've, seen, I've seen some of those, uh, especially about talking about the lithium yeah. mines underneath and the quartz underneath all of that yeah. property that was, that was destroyed, and it makes you go... Huh, you know, makes you yep. makes makes you question everything. So my hurricane for the hurricane, I stood up uh Carolina Savers 828. And um what I've been doing with my group is trying to get survivability items out to the masses. Um, I have a GoFundMe page up. Um it, you just Google in the GoFundMe, EJ Snyder or, or Carolina Savers 828. If you could donate to that, it'd be amazing, whatever you can afford to do. What we're we doing with that. that is we're buying up, and I can send you these links in an email, but we're buying up, um, and you can find it too, but we're buying up survivability items. Winter's coming. They're out there in Walmart tents. What they need is canvas tents. They need wood-burning stoves. They need certain things to get them through the winter. We have hundreds of thousands of families out, no home. They yeah. cannot get insurance because there's these flood clauses. And and there's not supposed to be any floods there, so they won't they won't help them. The government won't help them. They give them a seven hundred and fifty dollar FEMA loan. Hey, <laughs> fuck you guys, you know. So which there's all these nonprofits trying to really help out. Uh, I stood this up just because something had to be done quickly. I, as a survivalist, know exactly what their families need to survive. Uh, there's a I, I have a link. I'll send you to this thing called a rock pot. The rock pot, if you purchase one, you can, and on my social media, I got all the addresses you can mail this stuff to, or, and you can just mail this, buy one rock pot for a family. The rock pot is amazing. It doesn't need electricity. It doesn't need fuel. It doesn't need uh, fire uh, to get the, to cook over. You just have wow. the pot. It's like a crock pot. You get this, it's got a stone in it, and you heat the stone up in the fire, or if you have your stove and you're using it at home, on the stove for 20 minutes. You throw it in the pot. You put your meat, your vegetables in there. Close it up. Four or five hours later, you got a nice hearty meal to feed a lot of people with. While well, you could go do other survival things or other tasks. Wow. So we're trying to buy up all that stuff. So go to our GoFundMe. Help us out. Um, what I really was upset about was me and um, my partner, Jesse, uh, from Survival Summit, we did a film a few years back. Uh, I think we did it around January 2023 called The Ultimate Bug-In Home Defense Guide. It's on EJSnyder.com. You can buy the video. But everybody loved the video so much they kept asking, hey, is there, you have a guide on this? Is there a book? And uh, I was like, no, really, we don't have one. But I kept thinking about it. One night I had a vision that said, you need to do a book on this. You need to do it now. So I called up Jesse who's a troll under the bridge kind of a guy, very grumungy. Uh, And he's like, I'm like, Jesse, do you think we could turn that film into a book somehow? And he was like, um, no, can't be done. I'm like, 
You're, you sure? He's like, no, no, it's impossible to take that film and turn it into a book. <laughs> I'm like, well, I thought that's what you'd say. So I just, I just figured I'd throw it out there. Just forget about it. All right. Knowing my plan in my mind was if I plant that seed in his, well, guess what? He calls me up the next morning, like seven in the morning. He says, EJ, I was like, what's up? We got a book. I'm like, what do you mean we got a book? Well, I stayed up all night and I put the book into this uh, chat PT, this and this Google that and this thing and that we got a book. And so I started laughing. I was like, okay. He's like, I just need you to add your stories, some personal stories for each chapter, go through it, add some tips and stuff. And we'll be good. So by the end of the week, we had a book and we started shopping around uh sorry penguin you lost you could have had our book but you want to you want to you want to put out mike glover's prepared and couldn't do ours at the same time and neither book was the same so okay we so with- just for clarity not this mike glover oh, yeah, he's sorry, talking about mike. the other mike glover. Oh, sorry this, this yeah. mike glover is not a survival guy he's a cigar guy, he's a cigar guy. <laughs> for the record yeah sorry so the other mike glover he yep. was in Utah. He was a great guy. He's a, he's a mindset guy. He's a door kicker. Mm-hmm. He tries to prepare people just for hard days. And he has other people, you know, heading up different wings. His medical is his, his uh, but he's good. He's got good stock. I, I don't knock prepared. It's a good book. Right. Um, but we wrote this book and all that light is shining off that fancy cover. Uh, maybe you guys will put a picture of it up. So there yeah, we, we go. There you go. All right. So yeah, the emergency home preparedness guide by uh, Sky Harsh. Skyhorse Publishing, me and Jesse from Survival Summit put this together, and we wrote this to prepare you for bad days ahead, whether it's another pandemic, war, civil unrest, a natural disaster, uh, or zombies. Trust me. (laughs) Everything in this book is written so that uh, you can get ready, your house ready for bad days ahead, having a plan. It's all about planning. If you fail to plan, plan to fail. That's all there is to it. Uh, we want you to be prepared, not scared. So you get the book. It helps you out, tells you how to do everything from your food storages to water uh, to getting home from work, how to how to uh, get into your vehicle and get home. So it covers all that stuff. We talk about PACE, PACE planning, P-A-C-E. And what PACE stands for, it's an acronym because in the military, we love acronyms, primary, alternate, contingency and emergency and for everything you do you have to have a pace plan so you have you know i always call it in my classes because survival simple just don't die back up to the backup you know <laughs> people that love primitive fire i tell them all the time if you leave your house without a lighter in your right pocket another one in your left pocket and a magnesium fire starter in your back pocket you're an idiot because <laughs> trying to rub sticks together is even tough for the best of us so the Emergency Home Preparedness Guide, you can get it on Amazon. We are currently the number one best-selling new release, number one best-selling hiking and camping uh, category, number one best-selling survival preparedness, and number one best-selling security how-to and home improvement. So we got four categories. We're number one, currently number three on the top 100 books of Amazon list. So wow. go to Amazon. Just Google up EJ Snyder book. You'll get there. They're having a Black Friday sale right now. I don't know when this is going to air uh, for thirteen sixty nine, but they'll probably run it all the way through Christmas. So it's a great deal. It's a wonderfully written book, uh, and it's got great pages, great color. Sky Horse, thank you uh, for the great work you did on this. Um, and so that book's out there for you to help you get ready for bad days. I'm very proud of it. Uh, hoping it gets mainstream to the bestseller list, uh, New York bestseller, but we'll see. Um, I'm already working on three other books, a mindset book, uh, working on another book with my company of survival mastery, which we'll get to soon. Um, and so I wrote this book and it was a fight to get it out. And, uh, and, uh, ironically, it came out a day after Helene hit North Carolina. So I really wish people could have had it in their hands. The time to prepare is now, not tomorrow. Um, and, and this would have helped a lot of people out. Uh, I just recently, like I said, went into entrepreneurism. Started about two and a half years ago with a pickle company, which I'll talk about last. Uh, but recently this year, I've got survival mastery. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So survival mastery, you can go to survivalmastery.co, not com, dot co. If you use EJ, little EJ2024, you'll get a discount. You get signed up. It's a subscription-based platform. And we have 
with my survival background over the last over well over a decade and a half, I've gathered the best TV survivalists like Matt Graham, Ed Stafford, myself, Luke McLaughlin, Matt Wright, a couple guys from Naked Afraid Show, uh, Corporal's Corner, Sean Kelly from YouTube. I've gathered a bunch of the best YouTubers out there, as well as the best people out there at these survival expos I go to. Like I recently just got done at Georgia Bushcraft in Georgia in Watkinsville. If you like survival outdoors, these are the events you got to get to. I'll be at them every year, uh, every year. Prepper camp in North Carolina in September, the fall gathering for Georgia Bushcraft in Watkinsville, Georgia, just outside of Athens. Uh, it's usually in October or no, excuse me, November, around the middle of November. Amazing gathering of people, skills, and all those things. So we just launched Survival Mastery. We'd love to have you come on board. People say, well, why should I pay for something? I can find that stuff for free on the internet or, or YouTube. <laughs> well, the thing you don't get with that is you don't know who's teaching you. You don't know. Uh, you, all of our instructors are vetted, and we've already kicked two people off the platform. Nothing against them. I won't mention their names, uh, but they just weren't seeing eye to eye with us, and they weren't They weren't just They just weren't a good fit. Then another, a, one or two others that we were, were vetting, something come up. So they're not going to be representing us. Um, and then the information, we vet it when it gets turned in with the lesson plan. We vet it while we're filming, and we vet it in the final edit. So it gets vetted three times to make sure what you're getting is right. But we're not just teaching survival bushcraft skills. We're teaching everything self-sufficiency. So we have an old lady that's going to teach you how to pickle and can. We've got beekeeping. We've got um, one-on-ones, like backpacking, camping, because believe it or not, people don't know how to do that, and they want to learn. Uh, we're going to do a kids programming. We're going to be in the homeschooling, public schooling, university, and the Veterans Administration we're working on to get nice. this program out to so many people. It's 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 the cost of two lattes, two of these designer lattes you got right here, <laughs> uh, a month, if that, for one device. Now, we have a family package. We have multiple device packages. But we're going to also start doing gatherings. Uh, we will have lives. Like when you do a course, so you go through this course. It's set up so, like, the kids will love this. It's set up like a gaming platform. So you go through the course and you level up. Every time you level up, you get a badge. You get some points towards the store. So we're going to have a wonderful uh, gear store with knives and everything uh, to do with the outdoors that you can use those points to get discounts. So as you level up, there's going to be a Discord inside. People are talking about. We have a current Discord set up in Survival Mastery online on Facebook. Come join our Facebook group. Listen to what they're talking about. We give you teasers out there of what's coming up. We also have a social media, or excuse me, a YouTube channel, Survival Mastery, where we're doing some tips, tricks, and hacks and tricks each day, like one-minute lessons and whatever. But it's just a taste of what you're going to get with our platform. We are gathering a community around the fire, a virtual fire camp, where uh, skills are passed down. We want a library of this stuff to be the Encyclopedia Britannica of all things outdoors, so you can go to one place that'll always be there. So you'll have the information always at your fingertips. We've already started. Uh, we launched the 14th of October with five courses from five different instructors. I'm one of them. I do a knife only uh, class, which is kind of like filmed. It was filmed in the essence of dual survival. Uh, but, you, you know, you're going to get EJ and all my TV stuff that you love <coughs> teaching you some lessons. So it's, it's pretty cool. I'm very excited about it. I'm the actual executive vice president and chief instructor for, uh, with my partner, Bill, who is the CEO. And uh, very excited. It's uh, going to be the next big thing in survival. People, are, But this is the other thing. If you're in a survival school out there or you're running a survival school, you don't have to be afraid of us. We're not interested in running a school. We're just doing this online because what we learned, uh, and just same thing with the book. I wrote the book and this and got involved with this course because in the pandemic, we learned 90% of the world just stays home. The 10% that uh, do bug out or only half of them are bugging out just to bug in somewhere else. And then there's the other half that are like me. Same thing with this book. We did it to prepare people not to be scared, but to be prepared and give them tools and ways to learn and to do it. And a lot of people are intimidated by uh, in-person classes. So this gives them a chance to wet their feet, make them feel good, get a little confidence, try it on their own. If, for instance, if they do a bow drill fire, they can videotape themselves, send it into us. We'll have one of our instructors give them some video feedback on what they did wrong. Even our course instructors will go live 
on the Discord so people can come in there and ask questions about the course they learned. And that's how we want to be very interactive, very communal, because uh, humans, we're a communal species. Now, that being said, we're going to partner with some great schools out there to get our subscribers discounts to go to attend a live course, or I encourage them to go to a gathering and take some demos and some classes at the gatherings. And we're working and partnering by sponsoring those gatherings and getting all of our subscribers discounts when they go to these events. Uh, vice versa, we hope that the schools will send folks to our subscription-based platform. Um, so before I go on to my next thing, any questions about survival mastery from you guys? <clears throat> No, I mean, that's, that's awesome. I love the idea that you're, you're building these, these online courses. A lot of people today, I, it's kind of like the cigar lounge, right? Right. People get intimidated. They don't want to go into their first cigar lounge by themselves. They can find it online. They want to YouTube, Instagram. Yeah. That's how we get our message out with this podcast. And we help people learn about cigars. And I think it's a huge step the first step and then attending a, a, a live event, like going into a cigar lounge yeah. and having a cigar and getting in, involved in the community. So this is a great first step for you guys. I think it's awesome. Thank you. And, yeah, and then uh, me, uh, go ahead. I that there's a real good chance. I'm just going to die. And uh, cause I am, yeah, I'm terrible at this. And I, the only thing I've prepared for is a zombie apocalypse. I'm going to end up going <laughs> my French. You got one right over your shoulder, man. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, because he's got a lot of guns, but the rest of it, I'm probably just gonna die. So <laughs> remember, I, always have, realize always keep a fatty hour. around you. Always have a fatty <laughs> nearby. But that works not just for zombies, but bears. You just gotta be faster yep. than that one guy. You gotta be faster than one guy. <laughs> well, like the one of the most important things I think we can do as a society is become self-sufficient. We've yeah. we've 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 yeah. gotten so soft and so lazy and so comfortable. Yeah that you don't have to learn these skills. And if you look back at the people who set this country up, those people didn't depend on anybody else. They were able to survive on their own. And not only that, they policed themselves. So they didn't need all these freaking laws and stuff. They just freaking behaved. So if you can be self-sufficient, that's a huge thing for society in general. Yeah. And the other big thing that you just brought up a good point, I teach the nine pillars of survival. There's people argument all day long. Oh, there's only four, the core four of survival. Oh, there's six pillars. There's this, there's that. Well, I break my teachings into nine pillars. The ninth pillar is uh, community, tribe, leadership, teamwork, uh, and, and, and ta organization, task work. Well, you'll be surprised how many people live in a suburban cul-de-sac and don't even know who their next door neighbor is. That's where it starts. Find out right. who's in your neighborhood. If you have 280 homes within a housing unit, you sh the, if you want to be a, a helpful HOA, because I fucking hate HOAs, <laughs> but if you want to really be helpful, have a list of where everybody lives and what their skill sets are. Find out how many doctors are in your neighborhood, because that could be helpful if there's a real disaster. Where's the nurses? Where's the mechanics? Where's the butcher? Where's the, the dentist? You know, they, they don't know. And that's where right. it starts. First, learn what, about your cul-de-sac, then learn about your block, and then. Well, our, our church did this uh, thing a couple of years ago, and we tried to, we we wanted to continue it, but we didn't end up doing it. And what our church did was they sent everybody out to have, to meet their neighbors. They said, have a party at your house for everyone on your street. Yeah. And, and my wife did it. And um, we met everybody on our street and everybody loved it. They loved meeting their neighbors. Yeah. And a, a whole bunch of people didn't show up, but. We, we met 10 or 15 people on our own street and, yeah. and now we know them and it was great. And that's the great thing is, you know, you did just what you needed to do. Have that barbecue, have everyone bring a potluck just to community, just to fellowship and just see everybody. And now you have 15 newer friends that could be assets when you have a problem. It's absolutely dumbfounded, man. I lived in a neighborhood and I would bang on the doors and just to go let everyone know when I moved in the area, this is who I am. Hey, how's it going? Uh, these days it's funnier because most people recognize me and then it's like, uh, <laughs> and I got to make sure I got a little bit of time to talk, but it's okay. So, so survival mastery, check us out. Survivalmastery.co. <clears throat> little EJ 2024 will get you a nice little discount. We'd be happy for you to join our community. Uh, it all started for me with a pickle company and my good friend from New York. I originally grew up in Jersey. We were both dill pickle connoisseurs. And we used to have, every time we'd go out, we'd find, uh, be at a farmer's market or a fair, and we'd find dill pickles. 
we'd always pick up a jar for ourselves and one for each other. And we would test these pickles. Well, my friend's grandmother willed him her secret recipe. He used to always talk about how great her pickle was. And Jason, it was we met in the independent film industry probably 15 years ago. And we've been great friends ever since. He's an Air Force guy. I'm Army. And he kept talking about her grandmother's pickle. I said, you just shut the hell up about your grandmother's pickle. <laughs> what do you mean? That's grandma's pickle. Well, it sucks. What do you mean it sucks? Well, I've never tasted it. So therefore, Jason, it sucks. <laughs> Quiet. I don't want to hear about it no more. Shut up. Well, a week later, he wrestled the recipe out of his uncle who had it on a napkin under lock and key and sent me a jar. And I call him up. I'm like, Jason, what's this jar you sent me? It doesn't even have a label on it. I'm not eating no bullshit, man. What are you trying to do to me? <laughs> and he's like, no, go on video. So we went on video like we do. And I tasted the pickle. And I was like, dude, where did you get this pickle? It's the best pickle I've ever had in my life. That's grandma's pickle. Get the fuck out of here. I sat there, ate that whole jar right in front of him. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't stop eating them. And I was like, dude, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta go to town with these things. We gotta go to market. He's and he was out of work at the time. He's like, Do you think we could sell them at farmers markets and Trump rallies? I'm like, dude, you want a job? I want to take over the pickle industry. Let's <laughs> do it. I want to destroy Mount Olive. And we formed our company. We've revamped a couple of times. We are Freedom Pickles. We've been on a two and a half year journey. Uh, veteran owned, disabled vet owned. We help veterans. We're going to hire veterans into our company once we get mainstream. Um, we're in the slow process. A lot of investors don't like agriculture for the obvious reason, but we're in the we're in the uh, proof of concept phase. We just uh, passed all of our FDAs. We're getting our trademarks done. Uh, Freedom Pickles is, you know, it, it is a genius of a marketing uh, campaign that I came up with. But his pickles are amazing. We're, right now, we have four flavors, a dill pickle. We got slices. We got a hot and spicy. And we got a garlicky. And uh, we're going to sell our first 3,000 jars out the door, already sold. Uh, we got our website coming up in a couple weeks, freedompickles.com. Uh, and you'll be able to order them there. Uh, we're still working through the shipping process and making sure it's not going to you know, destroy us at the bank. But these pickles are amazing. Every we have proceeds that go back to help veterans. We're going to help homeless veterans and veterans in need, uh, hire them to work in our company, put them through the VA's uh, ag programs where they learn how to farm and all that. But the biggest thing is initially we wanted to be Patriot pistol, pistol, uh, pistols, pickles, <laughs> and they didn't do their homework on the name. So I pulled up Patriot pickles and they had a website and I was like, Oh Jesus, they got it. They got Patriot Pickles. We can't use that name, but let me look at their website. Let's make sure. Let's see what their what their marketing campaign is. So when you go to the store and you look at the pickle shelf, what color labels do you see? Green with yellow writing. Black, yellow writing. Blue for classic. <clears throat> Very boring, right? All the same. You can't get distinguished from anything. Now, the gourmet pickles all use a white label with either green writing, a stupid mascot, I call them stupid because ours are cool and uh, uh, or red writing. So I went there and I closed my eyes and I hit, I hit enter, went to their website and opened my eye and took a look. Oh my God. Can you believe it? The all American pickle guys, guess what color their labels were? Green and yellow. Yes. You'd think red, white, blue, like behind me, right? Green and yellow. The All-American Pickle. I was like, oh, my God, we're saved. Because I want to do red, white, blue label. I want to honor our patriots and our veterans with our mascots. So every one of our mascots represents a service of one of the services or a patriot or something in some fashion. So we have our patriot. And then the naming convention also plays to that. So our, our flagship is our dills. We have our Patriot missiles because the pickles look like a missile. And we have our paratrooping pickle, uh, Sergeant Pickle Cruncher, who's a World War II uh, hot cigar chomping paratrooper shooting, you know, paratrooping in to save the day. He's got his pickle gun. Uh, and then we have our firework frenzies, hot and spicies with our Air Force guy. Gunner Smokem shooting hot peppers out of his pickles coming in to, you know, bring support and bring the heat. And then we have our sandwich, uh, pickled sandwich mines, which are explosion of flavor in every bite. We got our, our mascot, Uncle Sammy, 
uh, who looks like a hamburger with you know the the pickle mines blowing up in his mouth, with kind of Uncle Sam, but we changed it to like he looks more circusy. He's got like a nice black you know oil can hairy look to him because <laughs> the white color was not working for the sandwich. Right. Um, <laughs> and then we have last but not least our Marines. We have a, a Gunny's Garlicky, and he's got uh, we've got a, a pickle who's in the form of a looks like a Marine Di. And he's uh, bringing the uh, you know bringing the scunion down uh, with his garlicky ways, and he's a uh, gunny uh, hard way, and he has his little uh, there's a little uh, garlic bulb in front of him called his name is uh, uh, what do we call him uh, uh, go, uh, garlic pile instead of gomer pile it's garlic pile, uh, <laughs> yeah. and so they're very catchy red white and blue. Uh, and I'm very proud of it, and we're getting ready to go mainstream here, going into 2025, big time. Nice, uh, that's exciting, man. Yeah, so really we got that going on. I, I own a bar in Bureau Beach. Uh, I'm half owner in Joe's All American. Uh, so if you're ever in Bureau Beach, come stop in and see Joe's All American Tap Room and Cafe. My buddy, I've known 40 years. We were 82nd Privates together. Did, put his whole life savings into the bar, and he got in trouble. And so he asked me, can you find me some money? I need some help. I won't make it through the summer till the snowbirds come back. Well, I decided to go in on it with them. I just got done selling another app I had my my shares in because uh, I wanted to get out of that thing. And I just put it right back into there. Uh, if you're in tow, um, if you're in Clearwater or Tampa, Florida, I've got Tober Me, a tow truck company where by day we tow, you know, apart we tow repos uh, out of you know out of apartments and everything. But by night we become superheroes and we tow drunk. We get if you're not sober, call Tober. We will tober you home. <laughs> and so we pick up drunks in their cars, get them home, nice and safe for sixty dollars for the first ten miles. Uh, that way they don't have to Uber one way and then Uber back the next day. Their car's not towed, ticketed, broken into, or stolen. So we're providing a service by saving a life and in turn saving other lives. Uh, and then lastly, Armed Forces Brewing Company. Check them out. Go to their webpage. I encourage you to invest in us. We are an independently owned uh, uh, beer company, mostly owned by veterans and the active duty armed forces, along with a lot of first responders, former first responders, and great Americans. Uh, we are 10,600 shareholder owners strong. There are some partners that own more than that. I'm working up into partner. Right now, I am a brand bad ambassador for the company. I'm on their advisory board for the Army side of things. Uh, Rob O'Neill, the, the Navy SEAL who shot bin Laden, is one of the owners, along with Ray Care Cash, who's a social media influencer SEAL. He was on a couple of TV shows like the Special Forces or something. Uh, he's also an owner. Rob, um, So Rob O'Neill, Ray Cash, we have a brew, award-winning brewmaster. They're based out of Norfolk, Virginia, and Alan Beal, the CEO. And there's a few other folks in there. But if you can go in there now, we're on our second buy. The first buy was $10 a share, and we're up to $12.50 a share. Minimum buy-in, $200. Bucks, but you get to own a piece of this company. When they go public, man, you're going to wish you did. And the beer is amazing. Over 30 flavors. We're getting all over the East Coast. We're in Virginia. Uh, we're starting to get into North Carolina. We're all over Florida. Working to Georgia, South Carolina, Kentucky. Uh, we're trying to take over the Southeast first. Uh, but we're also overseas. We're in all the NEXs. We're working on getting in the AFES. Uh, We're doing all those things to make this happen. So uh, really exciting stuff. Man, no yeah. wonder you only sleep three hours a fucking night. Yeah, for real. The only marketing I've ever seen more than this is KISS. So we're all miss is the EJ Snyder casket, and we're we're good to go. That'll cover everything. <laughs> well, I, I, actually, I actually had six other company projects I was working, and I had to cut them loose. It just was getting too much. And so and, and I'm trying to move a few of these things. We're actually going to probably flip Joe's All-American into a Armed Forces Brewing Company tap room. So uh, that'll get me kind of out of that one. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it'll be it'll all be good. You know, everything's pacing itself. The biggest things I'm, I'm mostly having to be involved in is I'm really passionate about the beer uh, with the Armed Forces Brewing Company. It's really, really good. Man, their coffee porter just won a, an award about a week and a half ago. It is nice. amazing. 
Uh, it's it's got the chocolatey hints in there and everything. Ah, oh, absolutely creamy smooth. It, it's uh, really a fine product. Um, and then survival mastery because of you know with through that I'll be able to still do entertainment things, but we're filming my way. I don't have to listen to any of these networks. I do everything my way. Nice. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. Nice. Um, the other ones are all uh, just kind of friends and came along uh, for the ride. Dude, man, first of all, thank you so much for joining us today, man. It, it's it's truly an honor. You know, we're a veteran-owned company. We love having veterans on our podcast. And, man, you got a, you got a great background story. You got a, a lot of stuff going on. We're super glad you joined us today. We hope we can help in any way, help get the word out about some of these projects you're working and on. Wait, there's more. I can oh, come back on man. and we can share way more. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I've got a lot of stories that we haven't even dived into uh, through the years. Uh, yeah, we'd love to have you back, brother. We, yeah, we love, would love I, to have you back. I appreciate you guys having me. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate it. So we're going to wrap it up this this week, guys. We we thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, please comment, like, and share the video on YouTube. Uh, we'll also post it on Facebook. We will definitely, definitely have EJ back because, man, he is a character, and we love listening to him, man. We hope you guys have a great week. Until next week, we see you guys all. Peace, love, have a great week, guys. Yeah! <laughs>